Hello and welcome to the World Beyond Belief. Uh, my name is Paul Marco, and uh, as we as we struggle with our intro on and on, we'll get it we'll get it right, and it'll be real polished at some point. But the important thing is the content. And today, the World Beyond Belief is going to have very exciting content because we welcome to the program uh, Dr. Matthew Aaron. Now. Dr. Matthew Aaron is a targeted individual, but he's more of an activist than that. He's really working. He's really struggling. You know, if you thought uh, some of our panelists on the on the Techno Crime Fighters Forum were were tigers, uh, Aaron is also. Uh, Matthew is also. Uh, he's got an interesting background, and I, you know, I've always said that. First of all, they're targeting the uh, the brightest and the best, and I think they got uh, a problem in in doing that. Uh, Matthew is a uh, doctor in uh, neurobiology and behavior from Cornell University. Uh, he's got a master of science in environmental toxicology for Virginia Tech, and if you want to target somebody that knows what's going on, you want to pick him. And I think what happened is, I don't know, they, they seem to pick people that are able to analyze what's going on, and they certainly picked a bunch of real fighters for this. So I think my opinion is they bought, they bit off more than they could chew with a whole bunch of people that we interview. And Matthew Aaron is one of those people. So welcome to the broadcast, Matthew. It's good to have you here. Thanks, Paul. It's, it's great to be here. It's great to meet you in person finally. And uh, I've been a fan of your work oh. um, after I was targeted. And um, recovering from that and trying to figure out, put piece together what happened. Some of your early videos on this from about a year ago were, were very inspirational. So thank you for that, for your efforts. You're welcome. Here we go. I'm really not facile with this technology yet, but uh, give me another 10 years and I'll be really slicked up with this. Of course, the technology well, will have... The social aspect's well covered, so... Right. <laughs> that's, probably my, uh, that's probably more my forte. Uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about you to give us some background, because there are people that may not know you. And uh, then we'll get into what you're doing now and, uh, and how we can all help you. Well, um, an interesting part of my background, I, I'm, I'm pretty much a hardcore scientist, um, and I've recently transitioned into more science writing, but um, I have 34 peer-reviewed publications in um, some top science journals, and I think something that's a little bit ironic is that I used to do a lot of research on weekly electric fish, which gave me a lot of expertise in digital signal analysis and in the body's bioelectric processes. So um, these things, both of these things are, are very relevant to, to targeting with, with RF weapons. And um, I think that gave me an edge. Um, it also gave me the confidence that I knew what was going on, which led to me uh, writing a 500 page, essentially crime report, where I documented everything that happened to me. And um, in, in Vancouver. Now, the background on that is that um, I moved up to Vancouver in, I moved into my apartment in downtown Vancouver in October of 2013, never having been targeted before, never having even heard about targeting before. And I moved into an apartment where I saw some very odd activities going on in this medical building right across the alley from my apartment. And over time, I came to realize that, that the, I, I, I was confused because I couldn't tell whether that seemed to be zoned for business purposes, but there were people in there 24 seven. And even in the middle of the night, there were more people inside that building than during working hours. And um, I saw some very odd things like people sneaking around in camouflage, um, illuminating other apartments, projecting photographs of people um, in the, that were taken in the privacy of their own home. And it, it was very offensive. And um, over time, I confronted these people. And, uh, and also over time, I came to realize that 
my apartment was pre-rigged with electronic harassment devices. Um, now, I believe being the closest apartment to that downtown center of harassment and stalking activities and surveillance activities, um, I think that my apartment was pre-rigged because maybe the previous owner was part of this network and the network can just easily observe the effects of, of their harassments on someone. And I was sort of that unlucky uh, guinea pig, if you will, or plaything. Um, but my response to it was that I just got more and more offended and I confronted them eventually. And that's when the really heavy direct energy assaults came out. And then it was um, a six week period of me sort of running for my life, trying to uh, protect myself, collect whatever evidence I could. And eventually it led to me fleeing Canada. And then um, I was so offended by that and, and I felt I had so much knowledge about what happened and so much expertise, relevant expertise, that I spent a year documenting everything and which culminated in a report that I finished uh, around um, January of, of this year, at the beginning of January. And I, I've sent that report to many, many people, including top officials like the Attorney General of Canada, the RCMP, um, the FBI, the CRTC, which is Canada's FCC, and, and so forth, in addition to activists. Um, the only people that I heard back from were the activists. Um, but, but I bet you my report did not get trashed by the government officials because it was a very thorough report with some novel and I believe fairly compelling evidence that I was the victim of this. Yeah, it was probably a pretty, uh, some, uh, it was yeah. probably a pretty scary report for them. Um, uh, certainly, um, you know, we, we, we targets or former targets or current targets and people that are supporting us such as yourself and your community, your, your um, followers on, on your YouTube channel. Um, we want to know um, what the government's role is in this because I tend to be favorable toward the government. I tend to give them, I'm still trying to give them the benefit of the doubt. And at the very least, they are now complicit in willful, willful ignorance. That, that's the very best case scenario. Um, and, and at some point, um, I, I think it's, uh, it is, we have the momentum and there, it is a foregone conclusion that this will get exposed. And that is gonna to lead to some very, very painful and embarrassing questions and very important questions about why it took so long to get help on this very serious issue. Now that's the very best case scenario. A more, possibly uh, a more likely scenario, one that a lot of TIs favor, is that at some level the government uh, got this whole process started in the first place, either through experimentation um, of new weapon and crowd control systems and radar systems by the police and, and by the DOD, which then spun out of control and is now sort of spinning into um, blatant organized crime. I think a, a lot more TIs would, um, would favor that scenario. And, and then the government really has, has their hands dirty on this at some level. Oh, I think I think so true. I think so too. I think the government is in there up to their necks, and I think they can't come clean because they're all uh, compromised. So we've got uh, what Catherine Horton would say: we've got organizations in deep capture. Uh, Karen uh, Stewart un uncovered a couple about a month ago uh, through a, a detective that she hired that Lockheed Martin has an ongoing franchise. In 47, that he operates in 47 states throughout the United States and some overseas. It's under the name of, I think, William something Cox. And uh, it's a franchise for harassment. In other right. words, you can take this trans, uh, franchise in, you can buy these uh, weapons, and you can shoot people for money. Uh, and I'm sure it's a gov well, you know, Lockheed Martin's a government contractor. So, yeah, I think that they're, I, I love it that you guys are giving them the benefit of a doubt. I guess it's because I'm such an old guy that I've, uh, 
I don't trust them at all and haven't in a long time, but uh, it's good. You got to work through the process and see what yeah. they can do. We got to let them try to straighten this out by themselves, I think. Well, um, I, let me comment on why I take that uh, stance. Because of my targeting up in Canada, I was um, in close, uh, maybe in a more intimate um, relationship with, with the harassment network that targeted me. And what I came to find out was that people that I, that I knew in Vancouver and considered friends of mine, there were about two or three cases. Um, I say two or three because it's various levels of friends. Yeah. People that I knew previously in that year lead up to me getting targeted then revealed themselves as being part of this harassment network. So um, the reason that I, I don't, um, I try not to speculate too much on the government side is because I was in close to the street level perp side and I saw a lot about that. And, and um, so I keep my my conclusions, I limit them to, to what I saw close in my in my immediate uh, targeting. Um, and um, and it, it was fascinating because basically, I believe that a network like the one in Vancouver, it may be, it may be run um, by a government contractor at the top or, or the uh, criminal elite, the technocratic criminal elite. But it's, it's being run like a pyramid scheme where actually some of the capture is that's going on is capturing the perp network at the bottom, the street level perp network. They're somehow being recruited or captured in and it's, and it's pretty vast actually. And it's really interesting to speculate how can they get sort of ordinary people to get involved in this. I have some speculations on that. At the same time, there were also police involved. So, uh, so that, that, and that is a, a uh, forward facing part of the government. So yeah, I mean, I saw that as well. Undou undoubtedly, there were police and responders involved in monitor targeting as well. Yeah, we found that we found that to be pretty much true. And I, lo I love your approach. Uh, you and Catherine are looking at the organizations. How does this thing fit together? Because if you can figure that out, uh, you can find out what's in deep capture, what's still salvageable uh, of the government, and how does this thing actually work? Uh, well, let, let's talk about that for a second. Um, on on the, uh, I, I have to ask myself, how, how do seemingly ordinary, non-hardened criminals, nice people, get involved in, in using energy weapons to irradiate people yeah. to the point of pain and, and, and torturous debilitation? How, how can that happen? And um, I think there's a, a number of possibilities for that. First of all, uh, you being a social scientist, I'm sure you're familiar with some classic work um, by Stanley Milgram, and yeah. there's also a guy by the name of Philip Zimbardo who writes on, on the importance of anonymity in unleashing sadism, um, sadistic acts and an antisocial acts. And um, I think there is a fraction, a larger fraction of society that we may have known before that don't have a very good intrinsic moral fiber and will allow themselves to do something that's sadistic as long as they can be remote and um, it's more of a push button fashion and, and they're basically masking themselves because there's almost no chance of getting caught and they have 100% deniability. There's, there's actually, um, technology unleashes this very scary side to human nature that we need to come to terms with. That's one, one key aspect to this. Yeah, I, I keep trying. Every time I go over the Milgram study, I think that, you know, this came out of Stanford. Right. And Stanford, of course, is controlled by Tavistock. So, so, so we could have something that's trying to portray humanity as, some, as something that can you lose their humanity in certain situations. You know, give me a, a situation where I can act with impunity and I'll act like a, like a psychopath. Uh, well, not... it's, important, it's important to note, though, that, um, that that is a fraction of people. A lot of people have the, have the education and the empathy and the intrinsic humanity to stop themselves from, from that. But it only takes you know, a, a fraction of people to be like that, to, be, to have that unleashed in them, right. and, and you can run huge systems of, of 
of crime and tyranny, basically. Right. And also, we're, we live in a uh, psych, parapsychopathic society where people are trained to kill people, people with video games. Uh, you know, the morality is not shown through TV. Our natural right. humanity is not shown. Our deepest, darkest uh, stuff is shown so that that becomes the norm. So it's easier well, to find people. Go ahead. Uh, undoubtedly, these um, these devices, these weapons, and uh, and improvised devices, so either sophisticated weapons or improvised devices, are are video game like, um, and, and and that is, and, and and the temptation to use them is so great for some people, uh, and I think I think this is basically what we need to come to terms with is that these devices and weapons and this kind of crime needs special attention because. Uh, it will get out of hand so quickly. Um, it is um, it is unlike other forms of assault, and it, it requires special action. And I hope we can take. I mean, society can take action on this soon because it will get out of control. It is very video game like. Right. I also think that. Uh, well, I always think of the governments of, as as aiding and abetting this. I mean. Uh, that's as bad as the crime itself when you're aiding and abetting criminals. And we can certainly point to the mainstream media as aiding and abetting this because they won't cover this topic at all. Even, even a lot of the alternative media, we've been trying to get, our, get the word out. And it's just now getting coverage once in a while. But uh, this should be the, this is the war, this is World War III. It's them against us, and right. it's not getting covered. So I would say that uh, the media is certainly involved in aiding and abetting. They're certainly complicit in this. Absolutely. But uh, there's another point I wanted to make about the, um, the low-level perks that I saw um, in, in Vancouver, because it, it was vast. I, I like, uh, when I speak about this, I restrain myself. Uh -huh. I, I typically say that hundreds of people were stalking me at times. But to be honest, it was it was over a thousand people on, on a given day could be doing this to me. It was it was a very large pyramid scheme, and I, and I, it was blowing my mind as to how it could have gotten this large. And so, let's ask ourselves: How could so many people be captured into this system to, to do that? And um, I, I think a lot of them were semi homeless, drug dependent, and it would be easy to capture them with. Um, using payoffs of money or drugs. But I saw a lot of other sort of <clears throat> people doing this. And I think um, I would see signs of remorse and signs of very great discomfort on their part at times, which made me think that perhaps they're being captured by, by being victimized. To some, some might be captured as being former victims, or at least they get into something that they don't really understand. And once the true horrific criminal nature of it is is known to them, it's too late. They're in the system, and the system can track them way easier than it can um, fighters like myself or like Catherine Horton. Right. They're inside the system. And so it, it's like this um, Ponzi scheme of evil, sort of. Yeah, it's, it's a speculation. But. I, think you're, I think you're exactly right. And people don't understand the scope of this program, the, the enormity of the program, even the enormity of uh, MK Ultra. It's a huge, it was a huge program before it went underground. Uh, right. And this program is, is, is massive. The amount yeah, of is. perps for each target is, you, you just wouldn't believe it. Also, I was speculating the other day, I wonder how many of the perps are targets. Right. I, I, think it's, I think it must be fairly high. Yes. I think it must be fairly high. Well, let me give you one example. Um, so I was um, committed to a psychiatric hospital when I, when I was uh, assaulted with lethal force about, from uh, a group of perpetrators who were, who were actually chasing me. I mean, this was not a, too covert of an attack. And there was a, there was a van that, that um, was in proximity during these assaults with a very powerful weapon which I presume was inside the radiation van right. or, or whatever, because um, that's when I got hit. And it was near Christmas Eve, and I was running through a park, and there was no one else in sight. It was just these shadowy figures following me in these vehicles. 
and I was pinned down. And that time I thought I was gonna be killed. Um, it, was, it was the most intense of all the energy weapon attacks. And it was still before I knew, I, I hadn't been through the whole process yet. And so this time I screamed for police to come because I, I, I wanted to keep the uh, perpetrators at bay. I, I, couldn't, I couldn't get to my cell phone at that time. And so I was, I was yelling for an hour and a half for the police to come. The police finally came and I recognized one of the undercover police officers. Um, so, sorry, uh, do you have, this is a 10 minute story, is that okay? <laughs> We've got all day. Okay, uh, Matthew. okay so, um, so then, um, as I was trying to explain to the, to the ambulance drivers who, who showed up and some undercover police showed up, and I was trying to explain, knowing that I couldn't use terms like, I was just microwaved or, um, <laughs> You know, a magnetic field just pulled me to the ground or, or whatever. So I was, I was saying, well, I think I was, I think someone used a taser on me through the air. That's how I said it. And um, actually, the energy induction in my body was so great that all of my muscles um, contracted at the same time, including my heart, oh. my smooth muscles. And um, with a, at risk of sounding crass, just to tell you what the, the, the dehumanizing nature of this attack, I ejaculated at, wow. that, at that time. I was electrocuted and ejaculated, Lucky in you. addition to all the other effects that happened. And I told that to the police officers. At, I'm, I'm a scientist. I was trying to convey the power level of the attack. Right. And the police officers just, uh, they, they thought it was a joke. You know, they were just uh, talking to me like an infant. And I'm a victim of a horrible assault. And um, then, as I was talking to one of the police officers, then I noticed that his partner in the, in the shadows, holding back a little bit, was the same individual who had done a street theater moments after I was assaulted two days earlier in this uh, bakery where he was pretending to be passed out at a table and all these cops came in to try to wake him up. And then only after I left the scene and defused the scene, I saw him jump up and and shrug at his, at his partners like that. It was the same police officer. And then I knew I, I was in trouble. Uh, I, I mean, the police, that person was in on it. So I just kept my mouth shut. And then that's when I got taken to the psychiatric hospital just for calling for the police, for being brutally assaulted at a lethal level and trying to explain myself. And that's how messed up this is. Now, what I, what I wanted to tell you, an anecdote the handsome guy. In I was treated with respect in the hospital. I, um, sorry, I'll let you jump in. It looked like you wanted to say something. No. No, go ahead. Go ahead. I'm enjoying. Oh, yeah, I'm, in, I'm enjoying this because uh, the, the involvement of the police okay. always fascinates me. Um, I'll tell you okay. a story about that after. So but go I, ahead, finish. Okay. So I have to say, um, on, um, I have to say, for this particular story. Um, I'm going to leave out a very sinister part when the uh, paramedics took me back to their locker room. I'll just say it briefly for 90 minutes, and they electronically harassed me in their locker room before admitting me to the hospital. And they, they, I, and I, and I, I saw, I could see what was happening. They wanted me to break. They wanted to be able to restrain me and probably inject me with some something that would have put me down. But they wanted to have the justification for, for doing that, but I just sat there and I took it. And then I went into the hospital, and in, once inside the hospital, I was treated with respect by the staff who may not know about, about this. In other words, the, the network may just have a pipeline right up to the door of the hospital, right up to the admittance to the hospital, but I, I was treated with respect inside, inside the psychiatric ward. Of course, I put in for an appeal, um, involuntary, I call it incarceration. I don't know what else to call it. I was incarcerated um, for, for asking for the police for help. And uh, I was given a court, a, a date. It's an internal review board. It's not really a court. I was given a, a hearing date. The morning of that hearing, I was released suddenly with no explanation which 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 um 
obviated the hearing by fiat. I couldn't, I couldn't say anything. I was released. So, so um, I, I couldn't uh, make my plea. I was released. Now, in, in the psychiatric hospital, um, a woman by the name of Kim, who was a, an outpatient, who voluntarily, she, t- she told me that she voluntarily uh, brings herself into this psych ward. Kim from Nanaimo, I hope she's listening. I won't say her husband's name because that's, that might be too incriminating, but she knows who she is. And I believe that she was um, a spy, basically, because after coming out of the hospital, and, and, and I'm getting back to my, the point that I'm trying to make is that she exhibited behavior that made me believe that she was captured by being victimized in the past. And, and here's why. Um, this was about three weeks before I finally fled Canada. And I was never going to call for the police's help again. I was never going to uh, call for an ambulance, no, no matter what happened to me. That was off limits at this point because um, why would I? Why would I let anyone uh, help me who who has a connection to organized crime like this? So um, at this time, the, the 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 weapons and attacks just ramped up, and there were these times when I was gang stalked for hours at a time by mobs of people using smaller energy weapons. And um, I checked into a hotel to try to get away from this. And then Kim from Nanaimo um, called me up out of the, during one of these 12 hour gang stalking attacks. She called me up and said, um, my husband and I want to sit in the hot tub. Can we come over to your place? And I said, well, I'm, I'm at a hotel. You know, uh, she should have gotten the hint that if I'm at a hotel, my, the hotel was only three blocks away from my apartment. Um, obviously, there's something wrong, and there's a reason I'm not staying at my apartment. But she was insistent, and I wanted to see where this would go. So she um, first had me meet, asked me to meet her and her husband at a at a Starbucks, and I walked all the way up there. I was electronically harassed, like I said, it's kind of like an electromagnetic stoning by multiple people all the way up there i waited there up and then i waited for like 15 minutes and then walked all the way back to the hotel as soon as i got to the hotel she called my phone and said where were you and i said uh no i was there where were you and she goes well we really want to go sit in the hot tub so let's let's go and i said i said i said i'm gonna see where this is something's fishy here so We went to my apartment that I wasn't staying at because the attacks were too severe there. And we went into the pool area of my room. And and mind you, I don't know this woman very well or her husband. So it was a very intimate type request. Um, But I I just wanted to, I I, I wanted more information. I was was curious about what was gonna happen. So um, when we got to the pool area of of my apartment building, the pool area was was more full of people than I had ever seen it. And we got into the hot tub and we were radiated heavily in the hot tub. Uh, there were people, with, I couldn't tell exactly where it was coming from, but I had my suspicions of certain people in the pool area that had curious looking devices that they were um, um, adjusting a little bit to sort of aim our way. And what I did was ha- now after, after I know this is, this is um, a mind blowing story, but so after already uh, having four weeks of experience, uh, many targets will, will report that they become acclimated to the, to the tortuous effects to a, to a certain degree. Um, they, uh, you know, it's still tor- tortuous, tor- tortuous, but you can, um, you, you realize that you can, you can stomach it and you can, you can power through it at times, at, at other times, when the attacks are very severe, no one, no one can resist those. You, you'll actually collapse or become incapacitated. So anyway, we're in the hot tub. We were radiated, and it was very painful. And I and I could tell that they were being radiated too because they were. But both she and her husband were squirming. And I, you know what I did? I just sat there. I acted impassive. I acted like I was having the the best time of my life, just waiting to see what their reaction would be. And um, I could tell they were squirming and squirming and just the whole series of events makes me 
very confident that she was um, uh, drawing me to that environment and that it was a setup. And um, because of everything I, I told you not, I can't, I don't have proof about that. But anyway, what that tells me, if my assumption about her is correct, is that she had prior knowledge of what it is like to be radiated. And, and she was, for the sake of the network, putting herself in harm's way in order to try to get me. And so my, my impression or my intuition is that she's someone that knows what it is like to be on the receiving end of a directed energy weapon before that attack. Otherwise, anyone who, who had no prior experience with directed energy would have said, what's going on? I think, I think there's a, a loose wire in this um, hot tub. I feel like I'm getting electrocuted. They, they would have been out of there. So, um, and, and I had many other um, instances like that, some even more personal with people that I knew as friends before. And, they, and so I feel that they have been captured by the system and they're, they're scared to death of the system, um, possibly because they know what it is like to be a victim and they don't have the moral fiber to stand up and to do the right thing. Because there are many people like myself and Ella and Catherine and Karen and Ramola, we are victims or former victims and we would never, never join the dark side or, or try to escape our victimization by, by joining the criminal network. So um, that, that sort of encapsulates my model for how I think some of this is going on at the low level. And, and of course, they're being manipulated. I should do this, I'm, I'm, doing, I'm doing it below the screen, but uh, those people at the low level are being manipulated and controlled through fear. Not all of them, some of them are willing participants just for the sake of payoffs or being sadistic because they're sociopaths. But I think some people are getting captured by these systems. And um, we all know that the system can keep all of those people in the dark about the true extent of what's going on. So there's manipulation both on the victims and probably also a lot of manipulation and compartmentalization inside the system as well. Well, you know, as, as depressing as that is to hear how they can corrupt your friends and people would be willing to go along with this, uh, your analysis shows possibly a way to begin to loosen this thing up. Because if these low-level perps, I mean, I was under the impression that they were mostly um, criminals that were released or ex-military. You know, you're ex-military, you're a trained fighter, killer, I don't know. Uh, you can go to the police or you can go to into this, this kind of a, a career. Uh, to see, well, let, let, go ahead. Um, let me just clarify one thing, though. I do think that the that the most of this, um, especially if you, if you think of this Ponzi scheme of evil, near the top, are the enforcers that really are like what you what you are saying. Um, but but I think as the system grows, they have to capture people that are um, that aren't of that ilk and possibly still have some uh, potential for being recaptured by us. Um, and, and that's, I think, what you're getting at. Now, just for clarity, though, I'm not sure that that's what the majority of what's going on. I just observed in Vancouver that there are some people now at this bottom level being, being captured into the system. My, my impression and my observations make me conclude that the systems are getting big enough now that they're, that they're capturing people like that. And, and you're right, we should think about how we can go after um, after taking this down at that level. Right. I, I have a story. Now, this story isn't about targeting. It's about people. Let me, let me see if this is relevant. <clears throat> I was a personnel guy for a, a large county in Florida, and all of a sudden we took over the sheriff's department, and the sheriff's department had prisons. Well, the prisons were lacking guards. Uh, it, was, it was really hard. They had to work double shifts. So we uh, made a major eft, effort to recruit uh, people to become jailers. Uh, correctional officers is what they were. Well, 
um, one of the first processes that we would would use after they would give us their application was to give do a criminal background check. And uh, we found for a while that most of the people who were applying had criminal backgrounds, so we threw them out right away. You know, most of the people either had been in jail, had criminal records, but they wanted to get into the prison system on the other side. And I, my, my, in my mind, I would speculate, you know, there are certain people who seem to be born into uh, this right and wrong, good and bad dichotomy. And it really doesn't matter what side they're on, they'll go from one to the other, uh, like the like the police perps and the you know it's, it seems to me when you're when you allow yourself to be I don't know incarnated into something that uh, uh, the, your lesson here deals with right and wrong black and white good and evil and so the uh, the cops are easily corrupted and uh, they honestly if you wanted to buy if you wanted to find out what was going in the going into the area or you wanted to make a lot of money uh, driving a truck full of drugs go to a criminal lawyer they know all the they, you know it's 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 like a it's like a separate level of society that's in this black and white right and wrong game i don't know might have, yeah. might, that story might have been relevant no no um yeah i i um I'd like to make a, a modified or add to that distinction and say that um, I believe you can distinguish people who have the fiber and character and empathy, which is an inborn, uh, which are inborn part human traits. I mean, because empathy is an important trait. Uh, empathy, empathy and shame are, are actually traits that favor the cohesiveness of groups. Um, it prevents people from from transgressing against the group because um, you know I'm an evolutionary biologist and right. I think in terms of evolution, if your group did not have stability and and persist, you're, you're a goner. Right. So traits are adaptive if if they um, benefit the group, but but those traits aren't perfect, and you also have competing genes that favor cheating, um, and so there's kind of a balance between those things. And I think some of us inherit both the genetic um, heritage and our upbringing that we have um, intrinsic morality that, that is pretty resilient to being broken. And then there's a lot of people that are, are apt to try out cheating for, at mm -hmm. times. And that's why we have legal codes, because um, if we didn't have legal codes, there'd be a lot more cheaters. There's these facultative cheaters. In, in, a lot of people are facultative cheaters. You know, in my lifetime, I've cheated at times. Against, I've, I've harmed other people through transgressions, um, but usually I feel bad about it afterwards, and then I try to amend my behavior. Now, we, we have traditional laws and traditional crimes, but now electronic harassment kind of takes it to a new level. And now our traditional legal code can't even really touch that right now. And so it's unleashing a lot of facultative cheaters. And then, of course, um, at the top of it are people that kind of live and breathe. They sort of um, right. inherited a stronger dose of the sociopathy factors, both <laughs> environmental and, and genetic. And um, normally we use laws to, to, to police those people, but we have, we have our challenges cut out for us. I mean the sooner that society starts to grapple with these questions, the sooner we can, but we have to have open discourse. Right. We're not even having opening, we're not even, we're not even happen, uh, having open discourse on this. And that is a problem. And I hope some people in government realize the danger in keeping this a secret just because it's a big embarrassing problem. I mean, eventually it'll just force itself out because it is, it is a very threatening problem. But, um, uh, it, it is sad that that, that um, there are so many corrupt uh, people wearing badges. Um, I think organized crime has always turned to and been able to turn police officers and, and get them to do corrupt deeds. Um, uh, it's I don't know. I'd like to maybe people even enter that profession 
because they like they, they have a kind of a domineering, controlling attitude. Some, but there there are also good um, law enforcement too. Um, I I just wonder what the good law enforcement do they know about this? Certainly, some of them do. Why aren't they Why aren't they speaking out about about these crimes? I mean, I guess they must be um, very very frightened. Uh, directed energy weapons have as much coercive force as traditional weapons because you know it doesn't feel good to be attacked by directed energy weapons. Right. But I'm sort of rambling, but no, I see, no, I, I see what you're yeah, I think we're in I think we're in an area where where we have to plow in, and both of us being interested in the brain and psychology and how these things work, I think we're as good as anybody going in giving a first blush into this. Normalization has changed. They've changed normalization to include a lot of things that back in the 50s and the 60s wouldn't include. There was a guy named uh, Eagleton, and he tried to run for president, I think, in the 1960s. Well, he was immediately thrown out. Why was he immediately thrown out? Well, he had seen a psychologist. And that was enough to, to dirty his hands to get him out of there. And then look at this last election. I mean, we, probably two of the worst um, examples of humanity were running against one another to lead the largest country in the world. It was, it was a total... The morality and the, the things that people would accept had been so adulterated that it was really hard, I, I, you know. So I think normalization, which people like to, that's what holds societies together and the cohesiveness and the yeah. conformist stage in development, uh, that it's very important. But our normalization now has shifted and they're, they're starting, they want to shift it even more, you know. Um, right. So that it, it's it's because a lot of human behavior now um, is is can be done without visibility and without um, consequences. So I, I don't know how to achieve this, but what we need to do is to make electronic harassment more visible. If we, I mean, eventually there'll be technological solutions to do that. But once the crime, because the crime is so heinous, if it's visible society will then react with disgust and there'll be consequences and that and that will be needed to to control this this um, this activity so um you know you you know where this is going is i mean there's going to be sensor arrays everywhere because we can't trust people with this stuff and especially law enforcement give me a break i mean through the wall radar and talk of non-lethal control That's weapons right. no no law enforcement has not shown any um, maturity or responsibility in the past. They cannot be trusted with these weapons and these devices. Right. Even if they have legitimate purposes, you know, there's going to be people that sneak them out of their departments and use them on the side. And in fact, I think that's what's going on to a large degree right now. Well, I was, I was watching one of your videos before you came on, and you mentioned Information Unlimited. This is a place where you can buy your own uh, directed energy weapons and start to harass anybody you want to. Um, yeah, it's, it's a basically it's a mercenary supply shop for starting your own electronic harassment network. Um, however, it, it probably represents uh, the the visible tip of an iceberg that's on the dark internet, where where this stuff gets a, a lot. Scarier and more powerful. I mean, um, that's uh, that's certainly not um, where this is all coming from, but it is. It's a manifestation for sure, and it's disgusting. It's disgusting, and and that company uh, markets itself as legitimate science equipment. No, absolutely not. No, you know, you can. Uh, I could. I could write up some fake letterhead, and if I had the money, I could start buying any of that stuff from them. There's no accountability at all. Well, that's interesting because wasn't it a couple months ago, um, maybe the government, I don't know, I think I heard it on Corbett Report, uh, they released so much malware uh, that it got out of control. So the, the spy agencies are no longer in control of this. It can just go up and corrupt anybody and anybody can use it. I wonder if the same thing has happened to this program. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I wouldn't like to think at all that a non-consensual testing program where this might have started from is is anything that's a, like a, a commendable or respectable thing to do but um let's assume that um that 
and and it's a it's a it's a no brainer assumption. Uh, there's non lethal weapons testing is is probably going on. I don't have any evidence of it, but it it makes a lot of sense. And and even DOD and the Department of Justice uh, can do this. They can legally do this through some loopholes. I'm I'm not an expert in this area, but let's assume they had some degree of control over, or, or, or the idea was to have a, a degree of control over, over testing for the greater good, well, it's gotten out of hand because the temptation is too great. It's, it's, uh, the genie is out of the bottle. And uh, you know, people, people in government need to step up and do the right thing. And that is uh, be open about you know, mistakes were made, but we need to correct this because it is, uh, it is out of hand now, completely out of hand. Yeah. And, and very threatening to the stability of society. Yeah, you know, they want order out of chaos. So I think uh, the more uh, destruction of the society, the destruction of the government uh, that they can do, I think they're, they're in favor of that. I think I see it as a, as a, as a battle of uh, humanity against the forces designed to take humanity down to a lower level where we where we operate um, as animals. Uh, I was telling this story, and this is another story. I, during the Civil War, they didn't have professional soldiers. A lot of people were farmers, and they would come in from the fields to fight for the North or the South. And they, were, they would hunt their game, so they were good shots. And when they would shoot at a, um, at a target, they were really good. But when it came to shooting a person, they would miss. Right. It, it was yeah, because, yeah, yeah we're, we're born with something that tells us that killing an individual is, is wrong. And so, you know, they made the target shape like a person. But uh, I think that we're losing our humanity through programs like this. And that's why I'm so happy to see um, guys like you and Catherine involved in reminding humanity what we are. We're not psychopaths. We, we don't shoot one another with energy weapons. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a level of, I, I don't know whether you, you can even call them human at this point, uh, if they're willing to do that. Yeah, the, the, it's, um, I, I really uh, respect you and commend you because I, you, you have never been targeted before, have you? Have you? I, no, I, I'm never targeted. I, I'm uh, I'm old, so I have the natural things going wrong with my body. Right, right. So, <laughs> but by interacting with uh, with a lot of victims, you you probably know. But I I really want to emphasize that when a pulsed radio signal starts stimulating your muscles and causing thermal burns right right through your body, yeah, not just on the surface of your skin, and stops your heart, makes it impossible to breathe. Sometimes if they're tuned just right, they can cause intense nausea, like, like a radiation sickness, like the most intense nausea that I've ever experienced right. in my life. Um, and, and just c complete um, interruption of your nervous system and uh, headache and, and like intense headache. I, I've had cerebral malaria in Africa, and this is, this is worse than that. Um, it, it, is, it is not a joke, and the problem or one of the features of this is that it doesn't leave a lot of forensic traces on your body, yet it, it has those kinds of effects. Yes, th this is this is disgusting, um, and uh, I, I just want to mention this on the recording because it is very important for people to know that we're not talking about, you know, like a little bit of tingling that I'm getting right. from from someone's amped up cell phone. These are serious weapons, and they're. Um, and they need they need to be regulated because obviously the temptation to use covert weapons is too high. But you, um, a lot of people um, describe this as a battle between good and evil. And I think um, you, you were sort of saying something similar. And I think there's some truth to that. Um, but I think for the most part, the numbers of people who are on the side of good are there. They just don't know about this, mm -hmm. and and um, people that have evil in their and, and organized crime in their motivation are spreading the word on this stuff through underground channels, 
and, and, and there, um, so let's say 50% um, of underworld sociopaths know about this and may have their finger mm -hmm. in this in, in, to some degree. 50% of those kinds of people. But of the good people, we only maybe have 2% or 5% who, are, who know about this. Okay, so we, we can get to a tipping point easily. And, and we will win, but the, the key is um, just getting the word out there. Um, I, I think it's a foregone, they want to keep this as, that, that's why their technique is to discredit, to funnel into the uh, mental health system, um, to mock, to, um, you know, to do, to do all that disinformation. But um, in the end, I, I think that most of humanity is intrinsically good because otherwise society would not have gotten this far. Oh, I absolutely think that you're right on target. Most of society is good, but they listen to CNN and they, they're influenced by TV and they're influenced by, uh, oh, uh, education system all the way up to postgraduate work. I mean, there's, um, there's all that. And then also, you, when you start waking up to this, it's so beautiful to see people waking up. And, and the, more, the more we do this, the more comments we get reassuring us that, yes, we, we're getting on board. I just woke up, uh, I just woke up uh, two months ago and I've watched all your videos. Thank you very much. I mean, it's happening. It's happening. Yeah. And it's happening yeah. at an accelerated rate because of you guys. And as horrible as your lot is, to be targeted and burned and actually slow killed is what it is. As horrible yeah. as, as, as it is, it's a um, it's something that's right up in your face and you can't ignore it. You know, Guantanamo Bay is down in the middle of uh, it's off. The, it's on Cuba and yeah. but we can't see it. We don't know what's going on down there. It's horrible stuff is going on down there. They're torturing people to find out how much torture they can take. That's that's that was a Seton uh, University report. So but it's off the off to the side here. Yeah. This is this is right up in your face and you've got to wake up to this. You've got to watch this. You've got to see it. And I think it's really happening. That's why they're jumping around trying to shut down the Internet and the false news stuff, the fake news stuff, uh, because they are waking up. It's just we really need to accelerate it. We need to do everything. And you're you're an activist. You're out there working every day, every day doing this. Well, Thank I think you. You have a, a, a fairly big following. And I think uh, some of your listeners are not are not targets. Is that correct? A, a good fraction of your listeners are interested, but they are not victims. Yeah, yeah, we have, uh, we have, uh, I think they're all uh, in some stage of awakening, uh, okay. but a lot of them aren't targets. Well, um, you know, and, and you're outspoken on this, and you that hasn't gotten you targeted, so I think that tells us that, um, you know, we can we can speak about this safely, and as as we grow, we're going to have herd protection. And so I'd like to make an appeal to people who are listening to this who aren't targets. You can help us. You can do the right thing. You can be heroic in, in a small way and join this effort on the good side and even fight for your uh, freedom and um, rights in the future to protect them from this by just start, just start talking about this. Make this a topic of conversation. And if you want to go a step further, you can you can uh, get your targeted individual shirt and start wearing it around. Right. This is going to become the talk of the century pretty soon. This is going to become a cool thing to wear pretty soon. Or I got these, I got these shirts for under $10 each. I, I made one for my uh, brother-in-law, who's not a target, and he came to the Washington, D.C. protest wearing the COINTELPRO 2.0 t-shirt. That's, so, that's uh, great. Yeah. Uh, you need to send me where they can get those and we'll list it below this video. Just oh, send yeah. it to us and we'll put it okay, on. Well, I made this real quick. You can. These shirts are less than $10 each um, or around $10 each. 
and you can make them yourself on treespring.com. Perfect. Uh, Perfect. Yeah. And um, let's see, I had another point that I wanted to make. Oh, yeah. Uh, this is something I've been thinking about recently, and I wanted to use this recording as an opportunity to say this. I feel, in my opinion, that the TI's community has already made a major victory. Yes. And it isn't a victory that helps us right now, but it is a victory for future victims. And in a sense, it's a victory for humanity and society. And that is, I think we have already demonstrated through documentation and these kinds of recordings and by putting our evidence out there that if you take a bird's eye view, this atrocity is happening. We have demonstrated that. And more importantly, we have demonstrated that we have asked government entities and relevant social institutions for help. And that's a victory because when this all really explodes into the mainstream as it, as it must, then the, the painful question is gonna arise, well, how did it go so long? How did these victims get um, institutional betrayal on such a grand level? And so the victory is that by, by making our voice heard to this point and documenting it, we're forcing some painful but needed conversations in the future. And I think TI should already be very proud of themselves. That's a victory that we already have achieved. It's a, yeah, yes, it's very, it's, I think it's very important. And also, it gives us all a chance to be uh, heroes for mankind. And I know that that may seem silly. Maybe, maybe that's a silly thing to say. But how often can you be a hero? That's, that's not, a, I, I actually grapple with the same thing. Um, uh, I think the definition of, I think, um, I heard this somewhere, I'm not gonna be able to attribute this properly, but sometimes you only have one opportunity in your life where an opportunity comes along presenting you with the opportunity to do something for a really important cause. And you can make a decision. And if, if you, you can either act, of course the window is, is pretty broad, so you, know, you might be afraid to act at first, but there's still a chance. This is one of those things. It sounds silly um, to me too sometimes to think of this as something that is this huge fight for humanity, but actually it, it really is. I mean, we're playing with fire here. This, um, it, if this doesn't get checked soon, it will grow into something that will destabilize everything and will completely turn law and order on its head. I mean, that's what it's all about. So I don't think it's an under, understatement at all, but, but um, it's the old me. And maybe it's like, by habit, you think, well, my life isn't that special. How can this be, you know, something for all of humanity? But, but it is, but we're not acting alone. There's a, there's a bunch of us and we're, we are presented with this opportunity and it really is an opportunity because this is a test case for future technologies that will come along. And um, the technology is developing at a very rapid rate. Um, the military industrial complex drives a lot of it. Criminals will always try to use the latest technology for control. And this is an example where technology sort of got past our social institutions and uh, slipped past our guard. Mm -hmm. If we learn how to deal with this one, we might um, institute some processes and structures to prevent this from happening again with more dangerous technology. So this is really kind of a technocratic uh, interaction of technology and, and criminality and um, sociology that is, is very unique and it is an opportunity and we are kind of paving the way here. Oh, yeah, I think it's, 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 it's like the fight. You know, if there's a World War III, in World War II, they, uh, the globalists, the psychopaths, were able to get the different entities to fight one another and uh, supposedly the good war. But it was people against other people making money for the banksters. This World War III, which is what we're in, 
They use directed energy weapons. They try to destroy the morality of mankind. They try to uh, meld uh, um, the, uh, the, the, um, the male and female parts of it. I mean, they're trying to take us down on every level. And those people who are waking up really need to stand up and be heroes about it. I mean, they're taking humanity apart. And humanity is, is a, it's a big deal. We've got heart. We've got creativity. We've got uh, caring. That's why every year the, the Bohemian Grove, they do the cremation of care ceremony. Our caring is what makes us special. And just by getting involved, and the thing we're, we're, over, we're fighting with right now is normalcy bias. I'm sure you've heard of this. It's where Oh, everything's going to be okay. Tomorrow will just come and it'll be fine. Oh, these energy weapons, this guy's talking. Yeah, maybe, maybe not. No, it's really happening and it's happening right now and it's happening to you. It's happening down the street. It's happening to your neighbors. You're trying to be corrupted by one side and you must stand up and be human. It's, it's your chance. It's your chance to be a hero. It's your chance to really get involved with the cause. There's, there's no other cause. And yeah, and let, let, let's extend that, that plea. Um, in, in the scenario where, um, if, if it's true that these, that these networks are capturing ordinary people who got themselves into something awesome. that was really something they didn't want to do, and they regret it, Mm -hmm. And they feel bad. And I did see that at times, even even be before I was uh, moments before I was almost um, life threateningly attacked. Uh, one of the one of the perpetrators and stalkers was weeping. I, I made quick eye contact with her as I fled past the vehicle, and she was weeping. It was a I'll never forget that because in, in a sense, um, I wrote in my report that it was like a lifeline was thrown to me because I saw some humanity in that brutal, sadistic, vicious attack. And, and that actually was meaningful to me for a second, even though she was in the perp vehicle, you know. Um, right. But uh, that, that actually um, had, had a great effect on me, and I, I won't forget it. I, I, I really want to meet that person someday. But um, I want to make a plea. If any perpetrators who have gotten into something that they regret, and they do still have their humanity, there's room for heroism from those people yes. as well. And Perfect. actually, uh, I encourage the TI community to be open to um, forgiveness and reconciliation. Actually, honestly, there's way too many of them to prosecute. So it's going to be like the R Rwandan genocide. Um, we're going to have to do that. That's just a practical thing. But those people who want to regain their humanity, um, they, they can actually come into the fold and they have a very special role to play because some of them can start collecting inside information. And as the House of Cards comes down, those people might be able to play a big role. So I encourage perpetrators who do retain some of their humanity to document and retain inside information on the sly. You might need it to actually save your ass from jail time uh, by making deals. So there's there's that side to it too, but you can actually do the right thing. Um, I, I believe there's a lot of people on, on the perpetrator side that do not want to be a part of this anymore. And we're asking for your help too. Right. And on all levels of the police department, all the way up to the chiefs, and on all levels of the judiciary and the governments, if you feel like you have some information that you could slip to us uh, anonymously or otherwise, it's time to show your colors. It's time to show your humanity. This is, this is, this is for real. It's happening. It's on. It's now. You can escape into football or the CNN uh, false news, or you can actually get involved. Pick up something and do it. Um, Matthew is is an activist, and he's he's uh, he's fighting this thing. He's making YouTube videos. He's going to events. He's speaking out, and uh, I'd like to be on his side when this whole thing comes down to save humanity.
Actually, actually, that that's true. You know, the the TI community is um, if if you want to get involved with some people that that you can trust that that care about other people, you know, it's a filter, and um, it's a great community of people to support uh, because you know there's no better indicator of someone's character than to stand up against this rather than to fold. Um, these are some really strong, caring people. So um, I've, met, I've met some amazing people in this community of victims. So have I. I, I can't stress that enough. We get um, emails every day from them. And uh, they, they've all been taking this. Sometimes they've been taking it for 20-some 20, 20 years. And uh, now, all of a sudden, they see that, oh, this is a big program. It's happening to a lot of people. And there are people that will listen to them and not think they're crazy. I, you know, as a psychologist, I think that the psychology community has really done its work to, to allow this thing to continue and, and happen and really played a major part. That whole... Uh, I don't know, what would you call it? Maybe a profession? You certainly couldn't call it a science. Uh, really needs to be disassembled and taken apart and put, to be, put together in a, in, a, in a better way. But this is, time, this is the time to get involved. And uh, the TI cause is a, it's becoming more and more out there. I mean, it used to be uh, to find a TI uh, Testimony video was difficult to find on YouTube. Now it's all over the place. We do at least one podcast a week, uh, sometimes two. This week we're going to do three interviews. It's it's coming out. Now's the time to to get involved and do what you can. And even if it's just something um, to try to try to uh, talk to your neighbors. I know it's difficult to wake people up, but here's a good. This might be a key to waking people up. Did you know that this is happening? Did you know that they took the Phoenix program, which tortured and killed people all over Vietnam, um, and they transferred it to the, to the U.S., and now they're using it in the U.S. and worldwide? Um, just, play at, just play one of the interviews that, that Ella Free's done or that we've done with one of the targeted individuals. And if your heart doesn't tell you that they're for real, then you're a psychopath. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry, uh, because they are real and they're out there and they want your help and they need your help. You're back. Good. Yeah. Yeah. We lost the interview. We lost the internet for a minute. It okay. happens. Or we're back on. Yeah. So. Okay. Well, um, you were you were, you were uh, in the middle of a rally cry, totally agreeing with. So I just kept kept the rally cry going, even though. Uh, and maybe you lost the internet also. Yeah, we probably lost some of what I was saying, but uh, I think they got the point that this is their this is their time to step up and take action. And we're fighting against this normalcy balance uh, uh, bias, where they think that everything's going to be okay. And uh, you know, if you have children or grandchildren, they're going to grow up in a society that's controlled by torture. That's exactly what they're going to do. Uh, you're going to be able to think thoughts. You're going to have the hive mind. And if you vary from the hive mind, you're going to be shot. So I think, I think it's time to wake up and think about you and your family and your neighbors and your friends. And uh, I don't know, take some action. I've said it over and over again now. Well, um, I saw... I saw some gang stalkers with with uh, young children so i think these networks have been uh kind of in development for a while and uh, this could become a general thing really disturbing thought but um you don't want young children growing up like actually being uh socialized as torturers. i mean give me a break yeah well that that coincides with a lot of the other torture yeah, programs. If you get a child involved in torture, Are we in here? yeah, we're going in and out. Okay. Uh, well, um, I was I was um, fascinated. Uh, you, you mentioned um, psychiatry, 
And I'm fascinated by that because I think psychiatry is on the front lines here and um, they have, they're going to be seeing effects of this. Um, okay, so, so their um, recruitment potential for the net, for the harassment networks, the harassment networks want to recruit psychiatrists into their networks. So they're, they're desirable from that standpoint. And, and on the non-corrupted side, they have the potential to see um, some of the effects of this on the front lines. So it's, it's going to be an arena that's, that's um, for sure, they have no excuse for not, for, for keeping their eyes closed to this. And, and my one plea to, you know, mental health care is important. I mean, I, I work in biomedical, in the biomedical arena. I, I write about mental health a lot. A lot. And um, I know that mental health care is important, but if they don't take action on this, they are going to bastardize their profession and, and face serious, society will have serious doubts about them going forward. So we really call on mental health professionals to step up and do the right thing proactively not after the fact and reactively, if that happens, they will deserve some blame. Well, I, I love the, the way you put it a lot better than the way I put it. Um, I try, I'm, I'm trying to be constructive. <laughs> yeah, I, I know, you're trying to be constructive. I'm sometimes like a bull in the china shop. But, <laughs> but you're exactly right. Mental health is important, and I've gone through you know, my share of therapy and... Uh, I've, I've studied psychology all my life. That's a, that's a big, important thing to me. Um, but um, it's, it seems to be now centered around uh, the, uh, the passing out and the prescribing of drugs and the, uh, <clears throat> the diagnosing and prescribing. It's taken the, the Western metal, medical model into uh, a real, I don't know, kind of esoteric kind of uh, realm where your your diagnosis is really kind of subjective, but your prescription is not subjective, and your prescription has real world consequences. Uh, yeah, I think yeah, I think yeah, if somebody's a, if the, right, it's almost as if the prescription somehow validates the organic basis to it, but actually. In, in reality, psychiatry, uh, for the most part, uh, I don't want to. I don't want to criticize them too much because, like I said, mental health care and psychiatry have made some. The, the field has has advanced, but there's still a lot of trial and error into the uh, dosing and prescri uh, prescribing to people. You know, let's try a little of this. If that doesn't work, let's right. throw in some of this. It is. Um, an art form, and it's <laughs> it's an art form. It, it's it's the least, I guess, sort of scientifically based. Um, but um, they are going to face serious serious criticism, and I I don't think that profession wants that, and we don't want that. So they need to do the right thing. And honestly, as I said in my report, with a little bit of training. They, it, is a, it is a profession full of very smart people. You only need to talk to someone for five minutes to distinguish a plausible or, or likely delusion from someone who is a likely victim of directed energy weapons. I mean, there's a syndrome of effects. There's a suite of effects from directed energy weapons. And so it's, it's almost a, a laziness to not, to not take that on, or actually it's more like a cone of silence. Um, being coming down from from the top somehow uh, for whatever reasons. I mean, uh, maybe they know that this is going to shake the foundations of their right. profession when this comes out. Well, there's been there are doctors who will stick with the allopathic medical model that's killing people. Well, it's the most uh, kills more people in the United States than any other profession. But they're breaking from that model and they're starting to do things like cure cancer. Um, and uh, use different therapies that were discarded by the allopathic model in favor of drugs. So, so there are, there are 
uh, human beings that are medical doctors that are seeing that we can cure people if we get outside the parameters of what we're uh, what we're told to do. And I think psychiatrists and psychologists. Mo listen, I know a lot of psychologists, and I've I've been in the profession a long time. I'm an organizational psychologist, by the way, and. Uh, most people that are attracted to that field want to know about themselves. They're very interested in humanity. Why do I feel that way? Why do I shy away from those situations? What's going on with me? And so they're, so they're attracted to this kind of uh, subject matter. Well, right. they're, the per they're in the perfect position to help us. Because if they can break away from uh, the DSM, uh, you know, that's the standard Right. set of books where they they can break away from the DSM and really get in touch with that person and you do it through listening and empathy and using your humanity. I mean, you can really uh, you can really help us forward rather than diagnosing children and putting them on, um, I don't know, ADHD medication, medication for uh, ODD and all those other uh, different things. Um, let me just reiterate the point that I made. I, I think I can, I can say it more, more simply and more bluntly. If psychiatry doesn't come to terms and, and learn to deal with this new type of technology and the effects it has on people, the assessment after the fact will be, what good was your profession if you could not distinguish delusion from being a victim of a cruel assault? Right. Uh, it, it, it's going to throw their field into question. And so they, they, um, they should step up. If they don't, they're making a big mistake for, for their profession. Right. We're, we're right on the edge of uh, mind reading technology, aren't we? You probably know. I mean, you can. Uh, I, I personally, I think that um, uh, based on my professional background, I, I don't have, I'm not privy to any of the obviously the classified technologies behind the scenes. So uh, I, I have limited knowledge, but I would say that the, um, the mind control aspects of targeting are overblown in my opinion. And, and, and but, but they're not overblown for no reason that because if in combination with through the wall radar, voice to skull, which is real and uh, classical conditioning through torture, basically, right. with, with, with that um, three-part arsenal of technology, you can um, cause people to conclude that their mind is being read quite easily. Right. I mean, imagine if I can just send auditory or visual signals to you remotely, and I can also watch what your reactions are with through-the-wall radar. I can mess with you in a way that would have any normal person believing that their mind is being read. So um, uh, from, from my background in neurobiology, um, recordings in the brain or EEG close in, um, even that has, sure, you can read someone's emotional state and there might be technology that allows um, em emotional state, levels of anxiety, um, possibly uh, muscle activity in the vocal tract, whereas if someone does subvocalizations, vocalizations, they might be able to mm -hmm. actually read that. But your thoughts, your internal thoughts, your high resolution thoughts are your own, and I don't, I don't think they can tap that. And the reason is, um, again, I'll qualify this by saying, I, I don't, I'm not working for DARPA. I, I, don't, um, I don't know what's going on behind the scenes. And there's some amazing stuff going on behind the scenes. But all the potentials that are going on in your neurons that are the basis of your thoughts, all the individual neurons that are firing, those um, fields and potentials get summed. The, the activity of them gets summed. So, so there's a constraint. Reading them from the outside is reading. You lose information because all, all of the um, voltages and fields are summed and the information is irrevocably lost. The, the only way to get at the original information is to have um, is to be recording it in the context of right. the brain's structure, which in a sense is flattened as you... Does that make sense? Yeah, abs absolutely. The only reason I went, out, went down that avenue was because 
psychologists and the field of psychology needs to jump on this and be able to delineate someone who's being attacked with directed energy weapons and, and a targeted individual from, right. than from somebody who uh, has other mental problems. And right. they, I don't think it's happening yet, is it? No, 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 absolutely not. I, I, had, a, I had a therapist in Vancouver who's, um, wh whose name I will not give, but um, I actually uh, respected her a lot because she, she didn't make an assessment on the origin of the traumatic and criminal experiences that I was relating. She made no assessment. She wasn't there. She, she, uh, that's outside of her realm to make an assessment on that. Did she think I was delusional? No, she actually encouraged me to write my report. So, so that, and my brother-in-law works in mental health care and uh, I have brought him around. He came to the DC protest. He doesn't understand all of targeting, but he's, um, he's uh, supporting my efforts now. So there, there is hope. And to be sure, the turnkey diagnosis of delusion and distinguishing that from victims does get a little bit trickier with directed energy weapons, or you could say maybe even a lot trickier. So it is a challenge that psychiatry needs to grapple with, but um, uh, I, I think they're up to the challenge even now. And as we go forward, um, you know, they'll be able to have biomarkers of of non-ionizing radiation and stuff. And with those biomarkers, you know, that will really help. It'll also help uh, forensically. Uh, pe people will be able to um, take that into a court of law. So psychiatry has its challenges for sure, but the cost of them not dealing with this issue will be com completely turning their profession upside down. And, and you know, actually, um, uh, or molecularly based neuroscience is waiting in the wings, you know, and that would be a, a way for them to step in and say, hey, with um, things that we can test molecularly, they're waiting in the wings, and there's all going on between um, uh, ne neurology and neuroscience and psychiatry. So if psychiatry wants to hold on, they need to step up to this challenge. Yeah, I think that's I think that's pretty obvious, and I'd like to see it right away. I'd like to see them take into account um, evidence and uh, and measurements, and uh, because I know if uh, let's say Catherine Horton and Ramola would go into a psychiatrist, they would have uh, documents, records. They have uh, when they're getting hit, they measure the uh, measure the uh, intensity. Millicent is another one we work. You know Millicent Black? Yeah, yeah. Dr. I, I, I know who she is. I, I haven't met her, but I know who she is. She's, she's got uh, x-rays of her entire body, and it looks like a Christmas tree with all the... Uh, all the um, what Lesions? Are they yeah, all the little implants that she's had. Oh, so, implants. Yeah, so, they, so, so I think psychiatry and psychology really need to start take into account objective scientific uh, things that are going on in addition to, you know, the talk therapy that they're noted for. Well, um, I'd like to share a couple more anecdotes, but uh, I, so um, can, we, can we wrap this up in like uh, 10 minutes, do you think? Yeah, why don't we, yes, that, that, sounds, that sounds good. It's always, it's always a it's always a question because uh, if you if you have a hard stop, then you might be in, in, involved in something really great, and uh, but if you yeah. just let it go, it just no. If that, that's great, ten minutes would be great. Why don't why don't we uh, why don't we head for ending it up in ten minutes and uh, we'll I get our. I to give you a little lead time because this this has been great and uh, what what you just said. Um, inspired me to share another another story. You were talking about how uh, Ramola and Catherine, uh, how we um, we know, we learn from experience what kind of uh, um, documentation we need from uh, police um, and psychiatric reprisals, basically. 
in, in this kind of victimization. So, uh, have you heard of the, the Moth Radio Hour? No, I haven't heard of that one. Okay, it's, it's, a, it's like a, a venue where people tell um, very personal stories, personal triumph, and uh, a triumph. Well, in Vancouver, there's a, um, I, I hope this doesn't get out to them because I, I, I really want to do this, but there's a, uh, there's a bar in Vancouver that does the flame and they allow people to stand up and tell stories that are true. It has to be a story that's true and that's about you. And uh, when I tried to go to Vancouver, I was sending reports to the attorney general and the chief of police and the mayor and the RCMP, I, I, was, I was blocked from going back to Canada. And at the border, they said, um, well, you need to get a, a, an immigration physical proving that you're, that you don't have any mental health issues and that you won't be a burden on the Canadian system. And this is just to go there as a tourist for a weekend. Right. I mean, I'm def I've definitely been put, they, they know who I am at uh, Immigration Canada at the, at the border. So um, I want to sign up to get, to give this uh, talk at this, at this bar in Vancouver. I mean, I want to go back there and lay this out to the Vancouver crowd. And I tell you that I guarantee you there will be some perks in, in the audience. This will be so triumphant for me to do. I'm planning to do this in uh, six months or so. But in order to get to get there, I mean, I'm going to practice my talk. I'm going to lay it out. I'm going to be completely honest. And hopefully, uh, hopefully they'll allow me to talk on that subject. And hopefully the number of people aware of this will grow to the point that I'll actually get a positive response. But in order for me to do that, I have to go to the border with my immigration physical, which is insulting at the very least to me to have to do that. Uh, I'm going to take my bank account records, showing that I have money. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to give the border guards no excuse for turning me away from Canada. And if they do turn me away, I guarantee you I'm going to be recording the whole thing, uh, not, not, not with their knowledge, but I'll, I'll be completely open about the fact that I was barred from entering Canada. Anyway, this is sort of my, uh, one of the little activism things that I've got in my, my back pocket that I'm just planning. Yeah, I hope it happens. I mean, Canada, I, that's Sweden light. I mean, that's, that's really the most liberal of the liberal. You'd think they'd want I, everybody, I you know. I would have would have had targeting. It was crazy up in Vancouver, though. It was, it was out of control up there. The targeting was. Yeah, the targeting. But I, I mean, I used to think of Canada. I mean, I would. I the only time I've ever had police harassment in my life was during my targeting, and I've been. I worked in Africa. I mean, even police in Africa weren't weren't that corrupt. weren't that bad and corrupt, you know. But um, when I went to Canada and, and my first, I lived in Canada for three years prior to all of this also, I used to think Canada was the most liberal, safe place, but uh, targeting has taken a, a hold in Canada. Yeah. And a lot of victims uh, talk about gang stalking and electronic harassment from, from uh, many different parts of Canada. It's, it's big in Canada. Yes, I know. As I know it is it's everywhere. Yeah, we get a lot of people from Canada. Uh, I, I would say that half of the people that write us that are targets are from Canada. Yeah. So it's so it's alive and well in the the great white north, that's for sure. Don't know if there's any relationship, but uh, as the rumor goes, Satanism is also popular in Canada, and and there might be a a linkage there on some level or in some cases. Well, yeah, I, I don't even know what to think of Satanism. I mean, it, it, it almost sounds uh, it almost sounds comical to me, uh, but I, I think I think there's people that actually are seriously into worshiping uh, the ideas and, and notions of chaos and evil. I, I guess that's how I would define it. Yeah. About, about four or five years ago, we got into the... I always thought that uh, pedophilia and child, child torture was the worst thing. So we started doing uh, podcasts on that and uh, got heavily into that and, and learned a lot about Satanism and uh, how it works and uh, the fact that it's 
it's it's heavily practiced by higher ups in governments and uh, all over the world, and it's it it can't be discounted uh, because it's uh, it's a magnet for psychopaths, psychopaths and Satanists. I mean, it's hard to tell them apart, but it's some it's you know a crazy world that I grew up in. Uh, didn't have things like Satanists and stuff like that. I mean, yeah, but the world that we have to deal with now, you have to take that into account. There's psychopaths, there's Satanists, there's perps, there's directed energy weapons. Yeah. Um, so, Paul, in a nutshell, um, is, is Satanism used as a, as a vehicle for controlling um, the adherence through fear, and also, because it's such an audacious thing to do, is it? Is it? Do you immediately get to blackmail someone because they're part of your Satanist group if needed, or or is it um, a belief system that people genuinely believe in? I would like to think that it's the former. It's it's a tool that's used to control people, or or do some people really get into the sort of uh, uh, religious aspect of it as a genuine belief system? Uh. I think it's both. Uh, both. The four tenets of Satanism is one, the worship of the ego. Physical body is all we have and just do everything to, to feed the ego. The second one is doing away with morals. It's all moral relativity. It all depends on situational ethics. Uh, the third is, since uh, the ego is all there is and there's no morality, we can rule the roost. Satanists can take over anything. There's like a psychopath. And then the fourth tenant... Like rampant narcissism, too. Right. And the fourth tenant is eugenics, which is what we're heavily into right now. They're rolling out the eugenic, eugenics uh, agenda, agenda, and we human beings are not going to take it. So I think you're right on both... On both uh, I think it's both of those things. They do use it for fear. Well, I don't, I don't really have time to get into the specifics, um, but I'll just mention briefly that the, the, because I was living essentially across the alley from a downtown center where, where I saw what looked like, even at the time, even before I became targeted, but now in retrospect, I, I second the motion that, that it was um, a training center and a ritualistic reward center for this yeah. harassment network. And um, there were uh, there was a lot of um, uh, rampant uh, sexual um, exhibitionism and behavior going on that, that I could see at times. And also, uh, um, there were ceremonies that involved um, cloaked, hooded, like Grim Reaper type figures that would yeah. come out. And um, there was a time uh, right in the lead up to me being heavily targeted when I was burning the midnight oil in my office. I was just 25 meters away working on something, but you know, I had my window open um, because that's supposed to be a non-residential building. And also it's my apartment. I want to have my window open. And uh, there was a ceremony or of some kind going on. And one of the guys pulled out a sword and pointed it at that in front of 50 people. And it was offensive. So I yanked my shades back and I, and I, I said, I said, I did this. Bring, bring it, bring it on. And uh, that 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 was uh, days before I, I was. That that's before you know stuff wow. hit the fan. But any, it, it, there were other instances, and I I um, I cannot. I I want to air, to assume that this was simulated because they they could use mirrors and projections, and I couldn't tell what I was really seeing, but they simulated sexual contact between an adult and a prepubescent child. Mm -hmm. They did that one time. And it was obviously also very offensive to me, but what can you do? They're, they're doing that audacious stuff. You, I mean, you know you can't go to the police when you're, and, and I didn't go looking for that. It was, it was um, in my face. And there was another time when someone held up a baby but it, but it could have been a, a, a prop. It was very quick. They held up a, a baby and shook the baby like this. It was a realistic looking like rubber baby or 
but we're a real baby. I, how was I supposed to know? But these were the kinds of theater that I was getting from them, very sinister. And there was also a ritualistic aspect to it. And I used to not want to talk about this stuff because um, I wanted to give my targeting uh, recollections and accounts and evidence and affidavits more credibility. But actually, I did put all, I put all of this in that 500 page report because I, I decided, you know what, there's no sense in, in uh, censoring myself. I, I, I just, I want to put it all out there. But th there were these uh, connections um, and, and it was, uh, it was mind blowing, mind blowing. Well, I, th I think that that's part of our reality now. They do things like that. They control governments like that. Uh, it's no secret that they blackmail people through pedophilia. I mean, look at the Lolita Express from the United States. I mean, uh, you know, you know about that. A lot of the up, up, upper echelon of government. I mean, your Bill Clinton, uh, Donald Trump. Uh, Dershowitz, uh, Kevin Spacey, uh, were regular visitors. They would take a plane to an island that was run by a guy named Jeffrey Epstein, and they would have sex with minors. And of course, it would be videotaped. Uh, it was, I think, orchestrated by a guy named uh, Maxwell, Robert Maxwell, who was uh, uh, part of Mossad. And uh, so all these people were, are under control because they're, they were. No, uh, it's like straight out of, uh, out of like the uh, intelligence agency, uh, CIA, Mossad, KGB playbook. It, it's like, are we living in some kind of sick James Bond movie? I mean, what is going on? We are living in some kind of a sick James Bond movie. When I first saw uh, Catherine Horton's website, Stop 007, I thought, yeah, that's that's what we need to do. We need, we really need to do that. Uh, well, um, on my, oh, go ahead. Go no, ahead. no, go ahead. I, what I wanted to do is kind of wrap it up, but yeah, I do want to wrap it up too. I need to go to work, and I, I would just like to make a plug um, for all TIs. This includes, uh, if you don't want to use the term TI, um, this includes anyone who believes they're a victim of electronic harassment, uh, unwanted electronic intrusions onto their body or into their home, electromagnetic torture, directed energy weapons, directed energy devices, including sonic devices or radiation um, RF devices or even ionizing radiation devices. If you think you've been a victim of this and you want to participate in something that I believe is gonna be very meaningful, there's this um, global TI survey can you read that? Yes, we can. Okay, so to join the survey, here, I'll put that up in a second. This is a survey that is being organized by two of the top um, leaders and activists in the TI community, Kate Ryan and Carla Smith. They've worked on organizing this and developing the survey for over a year. And they have as advisors, non-victims and NSA whistleblowers and American heroes, uh, Bill Binney and Kirk Levy. And they have experience on analyzing data and looking for patterns in written data. And they're going to be actually analyzing the data. Now these two um, whistleblowers and uh, former NSA, top NSA officials, they actually now um, have connection to alternative media and some people in government that are starting to awaken to these issues. Right. And they're, they're fighting for us, and they're interested in this, and they want to get survey data, and when they analyze the data, they're going to um, announce it to their, their contacts in the media. And I think there are people in the media that are just waiting. Some people in the media, they, they don't know how to write about this because what's the story when it's just people's allegations? You need at least a toehold to, to get in there and start writing about it. And this might be that, and this might be significant for future legal actions. So to join the survey, you just need to send a, an email to globalticervey at gmail.com. And that email needs to Let's link this up contain below. your name, your full okay. name, your address, postal code and country. 
and your telephone number, and it's open to anyone um, anywhere in the world. And they are asking for name, address, and telephone number to legitimize the survey and to potentially to be able to do follow-up questions and to maybe screen out if um, some of the perpetrators try to mess with the survey by, by submitting phony um, responses by actually being able to verify someone's name and address, they're gonna, they're gonna prevent that. But what they're gonna do is they're gonna keep the name and address and personal information completely separate from the survey results. They'll, they'll be, they won't be linked ever. They'll be kept in a vault basically. So the survey will actually be anonymous. Um, I just wanted to give a plug for that because uh, in my short time in the TI community, this seems like actually one of the, one of the most concrete things that, that we could possibly do. Yeah, the Techno Crime Fighter team is, uh, is very much behind that. We'll link the information below on this video. Also, uh, Matthew, can people see your report anywhere? Um, it yes, I, I, I actually started a Vimeo channel. And um, if we have, do we have five more minutes? Do we have, I know you're the okay. one that has to go. Okay, so five more minutes. We're, we're going to wrap this up, but I want to show. Okay. I just I just started a Vimeo channel, and um, I, I, just give me a second. I'm connecting to it now. We have one. We haven't posted much on it lately because we've uh, we're mostly okay, on so, YouTube. Yeah, go ahead. We're just mostly uh, on YouTube, but we do have a Vimeo channel. We could post. We haven't okay. gotten permission to do the long ones yet. Right, I, I, I purchased, I, I paid for it because I'm just, uh, I'm just trying to flood my stuff out there as much as I can. And I have a little extra money right now. So I'm going to share the screens real quick. Mm -hmm. And um, let's see. Okay, can you see the Vimeo channel? Yes. Okay, so, whoops. Here's my Vimeo channel. And... Um, if I go to my videos, uh, it only gives me a certain number of, uh, I have to wait another week before I can upload more. But on this testimony of a targeted individual number one, um, I, so, so the, the video channel was uh, Dr. Matthew Aaron, I believe, or Matthew Aaron. And the, the video was entitled Testimony of a Targeted Individual Number One. So in that video, actually, um, and my covers in the general video. Um, and if you if you want a PDF copy of my report, you can you can write to me at dr period m a t t h e w period a a r o n at gmail .com. So that's doctor period Matthew period Aaron at gmail .com. And I, and I'm happy to send you a PDF. But I, just a fair warning, it's 500 pages. Okay. It's a PDF. I can just email it. Also, uh, when you were talking about your Vimeo channel and what's in that video, uh, we got uh, we got Googled out of there. So, do you want to repeat that? Oh, okay. Okay. So, so I'm just going to say that um, my goal has been to try to um, document this, uh, at least my story and my claims and my affidavits, forever. So, in that testimony of a targeted individual number one on the Matthew Aaron Vimeo channel, um, I actually encoded 66 pages of my report into the video. So as the video, and the cover letters that I sent to the FBI, the Attorney General of Canada, the Mayor of Vancouver, and the, um, the uh, Chief of Police in Vancouver, I, I put that in the video. And um, the, the parts of the report that I included were um, just the executive summary and then where I, where I wrap it up and kind of tie it together, the, the overall findings, so which I think is the easiest stuff to write, not all the details. But then I really lay out what I, what I saw in Vancouver. So if you want to see some letters that were sent to the FBI and 
Um, it's all in there. It's in the video. Or you can write me an email and I'll send you the PDF. Right. People will ask for documentation. Um, as deeper, deeper and deeper we get into this, they want documentation. There's tons of documentation. And yeah. uh, Matthew has plenty of it on his website. Well, thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Uh, Matthew, if you want to get on, <clears throat> if you want to do a podcast with me, give us an email. And if you have something urgent, we'll just stop, make a podcast with you. Um, think, you know what? I think it's great. I, I want to get the word out. And um, if something happens, you know what I'll do? Um, I'll wait until I have something, something new, something new happens when there's an update is, is needed. If, if I start to get targeted yeah. or some big activism uh, a success happens, I'll, I'll let you know. But, but right now, so for sure, I'll, I'll get in touch. Um, but for now, I'm, I'm kind of behind the scenes doing some, uh, okay. some bread and butter activism. But I'll, I'll let you know, because I like to say, I like to talk about new things. So if something new happens, I'll, I'll get in touch for sure. This has been a great experience. Yeah, for me too. Thank you very and, much. Uh, um, give my regards to the techno crime fighters and to um, Eric Carlstrom if you talk to him. Okay.